Hello. Okay, we wanted to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the first uh, SCL seminar for 2018. And uh, today's topic uh, is the Internet of Things and Big Data Analytics for Supply Chain and Logistics. Our next um, seminar will be February 20th uh, by Professor Sebastian Pokuda, and the topic will be Applications of Machine Learning in the Supply Chain. And that seminar will take place at the same time, same place, on the 20th. Um, <coughs> our speaker today, we're very fortunate to have Professor Russell Clark, Dr. Professor Clark? <laughs> yeah, Russ does a little bit of everything everywhere. Um, Russ is very involved with um, our Panama campus, our Savannah campus, our Atlanta campus. Uh, he's big into IoT research, into supply chain applications, into smart city applications. You name it, um, Dr. Clark does it, and I let him uh, expound upon his, his uh, accolades. So um, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Clark. All right, welcome and uh, good afternoon. Non-smoking service. Okay. Um, uh, yes, my name is uh, Russ Clark. Uh, I am uh, both a, uh, I'm a research faculty uh, in computer science. I'm also a uh, Georgia Tech alum, at least from from grad school many years ago. I come. Uh, my background is computer science. I'm a networking guy. Uh, I uh, teach. Uh, uh, computer science, uh, uh, networking courses, mobile app development, uh, and uh, a number of other things over the years. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, in the most recent years, uh, as we've done more work in mobile, uh, that and and you know combining the, the the mobile and the networking into this thing called the Internet of Things. Obviously, it's a it's a natural. Uh, extension of that work and the natural application of, of what we've been doing over the years. Uh, and so um, this presentation, uh, just to set the context, I'm a, I'm a computer scientist, I'm a networking guy coming to talk about uh, what I think are some of the cool things we can do uh, and apply this work to supply chain. I'm not the supply chain expert, all right? You guys are the, are the supply chain and logistics experts in the room. Uh, and I'm here basically to, to share some thoughts and share some experience and, and hopefully get your, get your minds thinking about, ah, I wonder if we can use some of that in the, in the work that we do. I wonder if we can apply that uh, in some of the things we do. So um, as uh, uh, Tim said, I work in uh, a lot of things related to uh, the education space, uh, both with professional education, with our campuses, uh, around the world, at Georgia Tech Lorraine in France, we're teaching the mobile apps class this semester, uh, and also um, starting a new program in Panama. Um, just to set the stage, and and some of you, uh, you know, most of you are from Georgia Tech and know a lot of the context, but you probably don't realize all the things that are going on at Tech to to sort of bring all of this together, right? Bring uh, and so. Uh, we do have a research center at Georgia Tech around uh, Internet of Things uh, called uh, CIDAIC, or the Center for Development and Application of Internet of Things Technologies. Uh, this is a, a, an industry uh, consortium, an industry group that comes together uh, on campus several times a year, and uh, we're actively soliciting student participation in that. So uh, definitely would be like to talk to you more about that if you're interested. Uh, Georgia Tech also is the hub of uh, one of the big data research centers. It's called the South Big Data Hub. This is an NSF, National Science Foundation funded uh, research center. And, and Georgia Tech, uh, along with UNC, are the anchors for the, the Southeast. Um, and uh, so a lot of uh, activity around big data, obviously, uh, as well. And as many of you know, I don't have to tell you guys this, uh, Georgia Tech also has uh, a great deal of expertise and uh, experience in supply chain. Uh, again, that's, you know, I, from, I'm speaking to the, uh, to the choir here on this topic. Um, but <clears throat> the other um, thing that, that uh, I know that supply chain work is a, goes around the world for Georgia Tech, 
And one of the key areas of, of interest that I've been involved in most recently is the Logistics Center in Panama, uh, where we have uh, a full-time staff that focuses on very data-oriented, research-oriented uh, tasks, data-driven projects. Um, and uh, so if you haven't seen that, I encourage you to check it out. And this year, we're starting a new study abroad program. We're going to be bringing students, uh, undergrad students from Georgia Tech to uh, study in Panama over the summer. Uh, we're starting with these two courses that are really a good fit for computer science and industrial engineering students, uh, just so we can get started with, with somewhere between 10 and 20 students. Uh, and certainly, if, if you're an undergrad and thinking about, or if you have friends that might be interested, uh, I encourage you to, to check that out. All right, so on to the good stuff. That's the background, that's the stage setting. Um, what is this Internet of Things? Um, so we, 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 we know about things, and we, we have the Internet, so we're good, right? We, know we can make that work. Well, um, it's... With, I'm going to start by saying it, it's a buzzword, right? It's a marketing term, right? Uh, it's 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 you know the one we use today that we that we use to talk about this space, but it's not uh, a, an especially new space uh, in the sense that we've been doing a lot of this stuff for years. You know, some of these projects that uh, we talk about that uh, are IoT related have roots going back 10 or 15 years. Um, and so, in some sense, it's it's the you know this this it's a new name for the sort of for some work we've been doing in sensors and uh, you know RFID fits in this space and all these other technologies we've been we've been talking about for years. Um, but but this this emphasis on the fact that, that everything is being connected. And so, what makes it different today, right? What what are some things that that, that you know why? Why am I here talking about this today? Um, well, uh, this this opportunity, right? This this space as a business, this space as a uh, researcher, has has blown up in the last several years. Basically, uh, the opportunity is much bigger. Uh, we're now we're talking on the order of um, thirty to fifty billion connected devices. We we long ago passed the point where there were more things connected to the internet than there are people on the earth, right? There's seven or eight billion people, and now we're, we're pushing 50 billion devices. Uh, and the, the money being spent, the money being planned to spend in this space is huge. And so uh, that's why, that's one of the reasons we're here, but that's not enough. Um, the other thing is, from a technology point of view, uh, this is this is you know the timing is now that it's, it's the right time to actually be thinking and working in this space. Okay, uh, things are feasible today that weren't feasible five years ago. In particular, and we'll show some. Uh, my colleague Bill Eason, a research scientist I work with here, um, has brought some toys. We'll, we'll for show and tell later. We'll we can uh, uh, talk about some of these things, but. Um, Basically, now we can we can talk about building, you know, deploying devices that are are fairly small, but and have fairly decent uh, radio connectivity. But most importantly, from an enabling point of view, have really long battery life. And uh, the sort of convergence of all those things has really changed what's possible. And you know, what what used to be a research paper and say, ah, we could put sensors on everything. Or we could, you know, automate and, and you know instrument everything in this room or every package that's being shipped. Now that's actually feasible. We're getting to the point where the technology uh, is maturing to where we could do it. So, um, how many of you re re remember that it was only ten years ago, right? What was the last phone you had before a smartphone? Yeah. The Razor, yes, that was a popular one. Blackberry, right? I, you, you didn't want to call it a smartphone. I think that's the correct possible, right? Um, uh, yeah, before the iPhone and Android, we had Blackberries, but uh, they weren't uh, consumer devices. We didn't all have them, right? Um, and it's only been 10 years since this 
this change, you know, uh, has happened, and, and this miniaturization, the 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 you know the, the these devices now have on them a half a dozen radios and dozens of sensors, right, from gyros to temperature sensors to everything else, and that has forced this miniaturization, the commoditization, the the focus on battery life as a precious resource, right? Uh, that, that, that we need to enable all this. Um, I put a question mark there next to information security. Yeah, that's on purpose. Uh, it's, you know, we, uh, we, we have a long way to go and we certainly continue to open, uh, create challenges there. All right, so, uh, um, uh, continuing on this technology, why now? So low-powered wireless is one of the big enablers that uh, is, is making all of our interesting ideas from supply chain and logistics projects now more feasible. Um, longer range than RFID, uh, and by, you know, miles. Uh, lower power consumption, so years worth of battery life potentially. Uh, not days or weeks, um, and lower data rate. Now, there's a there's a you know there, there's a trade-off here of these three three parameters, right? You can have uh, longer battery life, or you can have um, you know faster data rates in general. But what we're we're seeing is, and especially in this supply chain uh, application space, is that. These, these applications, these, these ideas, these, these uh, uses of, of sensors and this, this technology don't require gigabit speeds, right? We're not gonna be using this sensor to watch YouTube videos on like you know, we do on our phones, right? Or to do voice calls. We're gonna be using this for relatively low data rate message applications like uh, the temperature in this container has now passed the threshold or um, uh, I sense that I'm near uh, a, a checkpoint, uh, you know, a, a freight door or a, a uh, uh, customs uh, checkoff or something like that, right? So, and, and we're talking about messages that are sent, you know, think on the order of a text message and maybe only a few times a day. So, and when we focus on that use space, it, you know, that application, it really opens up the opportunity for what we can do. And so there are several competing standards uh, today in this space. Uh, the ultra-narrowband, uh, uh, weightless, and then LoRaWAN, which is the one that we've been uh, putting some uh, work into, and the, the kit that uh, Bill brought to show us to, to play with today. Uh, is, is from the LoRaWAN technology, and we'll talk some more about that, what we're doing on campus with that. Um, so LoRa is uh, uh, the physical layer uh, technology. Uh, it's gain, gaining traction today as an alternative to cellular, uh, and um, one of the places that's being deployed in this country at scale is that Comcast is using it for their um, Machine Q commercial offering, which they've announced in several cities as trials. Uh, uh, do you remember the timeline for adding the next one? I remember on the list of others this year. I'm not quite sure it's this year. Um, and so basically, they're putting this, they're investing in this from a point of view of installing this, the LoRa gateways, the base stations, in their network infrastructure, right? Think about Comcast. Where does, where does Comcast have invested infrastructure? Where do they have footprint? In the, in, the, in the game of networking, it's all about footprint. And where do, you, where do you have real estate that you might be able to add some technology? Where does Comcast have footprint? Every home that has cable or inter and or internet from Comcast, right? So imagine that that set-top box or that router or whatever it is that is the box you pay 10 bucks a month to Comcast for just for the box and then another 100 bucks for the, bucks for the service, right? Whatever that box is, imagine every one of those had one of these LoRa Gateway base stations, right? Now we've got 
basically much of the country blanketed in, in this technology, right? blanketed in this coverage. So that's a big deal that a company like Comcast and many others are looking at this opportunity. So um, basically the way the architecture works, when we talk about LoRa as a protocol and the standards around LoRa, what we're really talking about is the interface between the end nodes, the little, these little devices, Right, whatever you've plugged your sensor into, and then the base station, something like this, or built into your set-top box. And that is where uh, the LoRa protocols are focused. And then we're talking about backhaul, right? To, to wherever you want your, um, to gather the data, to, to put the analytics, to do the smarts, uh, and, and reaching into your, um, <coughs> Uh, you know, collecting the data for, for your applications. So when we talk about uh, LoRa, it's this, this, you know, three components of the architecture. This is the key enabling part out here is these end nodes with the assumption that we can put these gateways um, anywhere we have, you know, uplink access to the internet and you don't have to have one uh, everywhere. So uh, one of the applications, coming back to the supply chain, uh, and logistics is this uh, use of LoRaWAN for asset tracking. Um, in the case of, uh, so you can think about deploying a technology of this uh, in, in either, in, in two ways, either a dense mode where you have lots of base stations or a sparse mode where you're really just worried about getting coverage with as few base stations as possible, right? And so when we talk about a dense gateway application, uh, so sparse, you know, what's, what's the advantage of sparse? It's cheaper, right? We, can, we don't have to run as much infrastructure. We, we can get maximum coverage for, for minimum investment. The advantage of dense is you're going to have more capacity on the wireless side, but from an asset tracking point of view, the real advantage of the dense mode is think about it as, ah, now I have a bunch of reference points that I know where they are, and I can use those to determine my location. So, in general, if I've got you know three or uh, reference points, three between you know three or four reference points that I can identify and use that, and we do this with Wi-Fi, and we do this with uh, basically this is how GPS works. Is we want to see uh, as many satellites as we can. Uh, if I can deploy these. Uh, LoRa base stations in a dense enough mode that my little sensor can see multiple of them, now I can use that for precise indoor location tracking. And I can actually do, imagine impl applications like there's a printable sticker that slaps on the side of an Amazon box, and that sticker knows when that box is set on your front porch. Because it sensed that your cable modem was the closest, and it sees your neighbors around it as well, right? And now, that's, that's a game changer, right? Now we have something that uh, is, is a completely different model in terms of, you know, enabler in terms of what's, what's possible. Uh, and that's just one example. All right, so uh, we talked about the sensors, we talked about the wireless and the technology to get it there, and. Uh, I could, you know, spend six more hours on that because that's part of, you know, that's my passion and that's what we, we do. But it's, that's not, that's only part of the story, right? What we're really doing then, when we, now we can do these sensors everywhere and now we can gather all sorts of information from the world around us. What really matters is, so what are we going to do with that? You know, what sensor are we going to make of it, that sensor data? What, what are the applications we can do uh, on top of that, and um, how many of you are just a little bit creeped out sometimes by the ads you see? Uh, right? Yeah? Yeah? Not just me? Good. Um, at dinner last night, my wife was telling me that she saw an ad for something that I had been searching for and told her about but I hadn't even come home yet. So normally when this happens, I assume it's because we're both using the same internet connection out of our house and the caching servers at Comcast 
are, are basically joining our searches together and, you know, and this is fairly common. But last night, she was, yesterday afternoon, she started seeing ads for things that, and it was a noticeable change, because we're talking about doing some kitchen renovation, and this was uh, something I was, I was searching for. She saw an ad for it, something I had searched for an hour before, not anywhere near home. The only communication we had was, was on the phone. And now we're really creeped out, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, this is this is uh, this is amazing. What's possible and kind of scary too. All right, so um, uh, when we talk, you hear big data all the time. What is big data? You know, and so I wanted to uh, take a moment to define uh, the term. You know, we have a whole uh, research that we have research centers at Georgia Tech on big data. We have. Uh, master's degrees in analytics and uh, all these sorts of things happening now. Um, but uh, let's set the stage and, and make sure we all agree on what's big data and what are the challenges. And IoT is contributing massively to this, right? And so we can't talk about IoT without talking about big data. So the first, we, we describe big data in five Vs, right? Uh, the first one is volume, lots of data, right? That's the easy one. It's coming at us in big amounts, right? Not necessarily big chunks, lots of little chunks sometimes, but there's lots of it. It's data coming from a variety of sources, all kinds of sensors, but not just all those sensors, what else? Apparently, my web searches for kitchen appliances. Apparently, my conversations about kitchen appliances, right? There's a whole bunch of unstructured data from different sources that's all coming together and, and, and part of this big data story. And when we talk about uh, the analytics on big data, one of the big challenges is this variety and the fact that so much of it is unstructured. Um, it's not just a lot of it, but it's coming fast. So with high velocity. And then those are the three V's that I, folk, I group in the how the data is coming at us. The other two V's are more on how we're dealing with that data and how we're processing that data. First is the goal of big data analytics is to bring us, to learn something from it, to bring us valuable insight, right? To make the uh, decision that someone else at Russ's house must be interested in kitchen appliances. I'm gonna be hung up on that story for a while. <laughs> um, uh, but for more importantly, to gather the insight from uh, all of this information about weather and traffic and um, sports activity schedules and whatever else might affect, hey, we should adjust our, uh, maybe we should adjust our uh, urban delivery, uh, you know, our truck rolls so that they avoid I don't know, national championship football games happening uh, uh, the same day they think it's going to snow and uh, you know, whatever else is going on in, in Atlanta at the same time. So when we talk about you know, optimizing uh, you know, shipping or delivery or uh, even um, <coughs> you know, how, how we package things, right? now we have this, this whole wealth of, of possible sources of information that, that we're going to want to bring to the table, but it's only useful, it, you know, it's only meaningful. We've, we've wasted our money on all of this unless we can actually come to some conclusion that improves, uh, you know, uh, what we're doing. So it you know, improves our delivery schedules or whatever. Um, and then with, then, then this is the one I'm, I'm, you know, they stretch to get another V, right? Uh, they say, like, ah, oh, what, what's a V word that, that tells us, uh, it's a veracity. Um, the point is, this one is actually one of the places that I think the research and the, some of the stuff we've been doing <coughs> with the sensors in particular, this is actually the fun stuff where it gets interesting. My best student projects that, you know, that I have students working on are not the ones with the canned, clean, sanitized data set that, that they use in every database class every semester that just, you know, a big chunk of data. No, no. The good projects are the ones where it's real sensor data and two-thirds of it is noise. 
But I don't know which is the noise and which is the good stuff. And we gotta figure out which of those values we can trust and which ones we gotta throw away. And that is really where the, um, you know, if, if that's where, to me, some of the most interesting work is. That's some of where some of the most interesting applications of AI and machine learning and all of these interesting sort of uh, analytics techniques that we work on. We're trying to figure out, you know, which of this data is good and which of it is is not before we can go start uh, gathering, uh, you know, making making decisions about it. All right. So summary: five Bs of big data. Uh, now you know. There's your. Uh, 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 you know, we can you can win an argument and a cocktail party now over uh, what's the definition of big data. Um, all right. So the other thing that when we talk about you know why today and why do we think this is possible, uh, the other thing we have to leverage and the other thing we're doing that makes uh, IoT applications in the real world feasible today is the cloud. But by the cloud, I mean the fact that we don't have to own all the physical compute and storage resources ourselves. We get to leverage those from third-party providers. We get to allocate them quickly and then deallocate them when we're done so that we don't have to pay for resources we're not using. Um, and uh, without that you know, sort of capability, you know, dealing with this huge volume of data would be much more expensive. So this is a big part uh, of, of uh, this as well. As we've um, moved into more applications of IoT, and this is really in uh, the uh, really comes to play in the smart cities work, where we're talking about uh, uh, deploying these sensors and, and technologies in the urban environment, where we're going to improve traffic, or we're going to improve. Uh, uh, the, the way the city functions. Um, more and more what we're finding in this space is the importance of data sharing agreements. The fact that um, no single place, you know, we want to do this big data analytics. We want to bring in all of this information in order to make better decisions. We can't do that by declaring, okay, one person is going to own all the data. One entity is going to own all the data. And that's how we're going to get it done. It, there will always be some other piece of data we need that we want to add to it. And the, there will always be some need for an agreement to figure out how to get to that, right? And so these types of agreement, what do I mean by agreement? Well, we have to agree on lots of things. There are data formats uh, are sort of the, you know, the easy one. You know, how are we going to connect and, and move the data? But the actual harder ones are, uh, what about data use policy? What am I allowed to use the data for? Um, liability has turned out to, up to be a, a, a roadblock for some of this data sharing. Whether we're talking about cities sharing data with state governments or between cities, or uh, in the supply chain space, and when we're talking about improving logistics, for instance, with urban delivery, guess what? We've got a whole bunch of competitors all trying to make deliveries in the same space at the same time. And in order for that optimization right, to really work, we actually have to, uh, we can't just you know, focus on the UPS trucks. That might help UPS, but it doesn't help the, you know, to some degree, but it doesn't help the city uh, as a whole, or the, solve the problem as a whole. We've got to work with all of them and it's not just the big uh, shippers, the UBSs and the FedEx, but all the, the, the smaller ones as well, right? And so um, the, uh, the space uh, is a challenge from a point of view of you know, people protecting their own interests and their own um, uh, you know, proprietary information, but then also the liability piece. And the, the easiest example of the liability one is, um, you know, yes, there's lots of interesting things we can do about optimizing uh, response time for ambulances, right? But what happens when the data we relied on to <coughs> get the ambulance to the right place at the right time actually was some of that 30% of data or 60% of data I should have thrown out because it was wrong. And we actually sent the ambulance to the wrong place. 
or they were delayed an extra 20 minutes or whatever it is, right? When someone dies because my really smart algorithm actually made things worse, now what, right? And so even though when you start the conversation on data sharing, everybody says, oh yes, we should all share data. When you actually get to the legal agreements that we have to sign, somewhere there's going to be an indemnity clause, right? That's the language we use that says, uh, you know, I'm not responsible for anything that's in this data. And whatever you do with it is not my problem. Well, uh, those are actually really hard things to get, you know, especially a guy that works for a state institution. I don't know, some of you have dealt with contracting at Georgia Tech. Um, indemnity clauses are kind of those things that are really hard to get, get signed off. Right? So I have a whole bunch of data sharing agreements that are stuck on this, this issue, right, for instance. So anyway. For a completely another talk, nobody said, hey, what about blockchain? Yeah, I know, blockchain solves everything, <laughs> right? Uh, we'll talk about that another time. Uh, but this data sharing is, in fact, a potential application. So there's some interesting work in the use of blockchain uh, for uh, data sharing. All right, so uh, to summarize uh, this uh, sort of overview of the technology and big data and, and where we can apply it and what obviously we you know I'm here because uh, we think there and we have seen lots of opportunities and started exploring lots of opportunities in applying IOT and big data to to uh, supply chain logistics uh, asset tracking uh, all sorts of infrastructure monitoring and maintenance um, you know the, the predictive maintenance of you know, I want sensors on every piece of equipment, right? You know, vibration sensors on motors and pumps and gears, houses and whatever, so that I know I can, I, so that I can prepare to do maintenance on it instead of waiting for the thing to fail tragically and then I'm down for two weeks, right? Those are the kinds of real applications that, that we're seeing. Um, uh, storage uh, uh, sensing, obviously, well, the whole cold chain, Right, uh, space. Anytime we have to worry about climate control, end to end, throughout the process, uh, uh, we're seeing lots of application of, of an interest in, in IoT for that. Um, you know, alert the driver that the. You know, how many of you have been driving down the road and had the the you know the refrigerator the, behind the refrigerator trailer blowing water at you because clearly that cooler broke and this thing is melting, right? Um, uh, someone should stop the driver and say, hey, you, pull over and fix the refrigerator. Um, uh, and so, uh, uh, anyway, security monitoring, customs processing, uh, multimodal routing, um, multi-party data sharing, as I talked about, and then what's near and dear to our hearts from the point of view of, of IoT and supply chain is, is the education part of it. Um, all right, so uh, just some, some, a few slides with some stats on, you know, is, is, is Russ making this up or is this, is this real? Um, uh, and the reality is that we are seeing uh, uh, very real spending on, on connected logistics solutions globally uh, and, it's, and it's ramping up. Uh, just one example of uh, fleet management uh, right, so commercial uh, fleet, commercial trucks, right? Think delivery vans, everything from uh, the the or you know uh, installers and maintenance crews as well, but uh, everything from the small FedEx uh, van all the way up to uh, the over the road interstate truck, long haul truck. Um, in the last, uh, you know, it was for several years there were there was pretty good investment and pretty good adoption, especially from the big carriers, right? You know, the, the Freightways or the, the Schneiders or the J.B. Hunts or something like that. Um, but now we've, we've sort of crossed that uh, adoption threshold to where uh, basically you can't be in the trucking business and not do this. You can't afford this, you know, to avoid doing this. And we're seeing it, uh, you know, all the way out to the, down to the even the smaller operators. Um, all right, so with the time that's left, what I want to do is talk about some projects that, you know, I mentioned this, this IoT thing, 
It's just the, just today's brand. You know, next year I'll come back and I'll call it something else. Um, maybe two years, I don't know. But the, the, the point is, the, the, you know, this is the kind of stuff that the Georgia Tech has been involved in and leading for many years. Um, and uh, these are some of the projects that we've been doing. So um, one of the focuses we've had one of the, uh, for many years is this issue of um, tracking without GPS. So a location determination without the GPS. Uh, why? Well, because in this room, your GPS receiver doesn't work. In general, indoors, GPS doesn't work. work. Um, but it's not just indoors. Uh, does anyone know what an urban canyon is? Have you heard the term urban canyon? What's an urban canyon? Right? Have you ever felt like you're you know, in the Grand Canyon when you're driving down the street in a big city because you can't see the sun because it's blocked out from all the buildings? Right? Uh, basically, if you can't see the sun, guess what? You can't see the GPS satellites either. So, you know, driving down uh, a, a, a busy street in a city, you know, in a, in a congested city, typically where, you know, Waze is trying to reroute you because you're stuck in traffic, well, guess what? Now Waze thinks you're three blocks away because it doesn't, the, your GPS isn't working either. Um, so, um, uh, lots of ways that we can address this issue and have looked at it over the years uh, using other uh, location infrastructure. I mentioned this use case for LoRa of dense deployment and being able to use the LoRa base stations to detect what is the location of this sensor, again without GPS. In that case, it's not so much, and so there, there's really two advantages. One is, you know, maybe I can't see the GPS, but the other advantage is GPS is actually still a really expensive chip to operate. The GPS is just a receiver, not a transmitter. It actually consumes a lot of power to power up that GPS and calculate your location. So the real advantage for this, being able to do this without a GPS chip is, remember that printable sticker I want to slap on the side? Um, I don't want it to cost, have the cost associated with a GPS receiver. But I also don't want it to have the battery consumption associated with a GPS receiver. So um, all sorts of ways to think about this. Oh, location versus proximity. A lot of times people say, I need to determine the exact location of this thing because I want to tell how close it is to this other thing. Well, actually then, if your application is, how close am I to this other thing? There's a lot, cheap, there's a lot cheaper ways to figure that out than if, um, than determining your precise location. So proximity, how close am I to that door? How close am I to uh, the, the uh, destination that I'm trying to reach, that, that shelf that I'm supposed to be sitting on, whatever it is. Um, and so we've been uh, working in this space with test beds across campus for many years and different versions of it, and um, uh, including the, the uh, campus Wi-Fi infrastructure you know, we have APIs for determining your location, the location of a Wi-Fi device based on uh, where it is relative to the, the infrastructure. Um, <coughs> ah, but what if the question is not where am I, but how many people are around me, or how many packages are around me, or how many devices, or how many, or what if it's not around me, what if I'm managing the campus uh, facilities and I want to know the utilization of different classrooms on campus, right? Or I want to know how many people are using this, uh, how many people are waiting in line at, at Starbucks is actually you know, one of, a, a popular question. Um, uh, and so it turns out that the same sort of infrastructure that we've developed for determining location if you, if you turn the question around and say, ah, I just want to know how many people are in this space, that same technology and many of those same, same tricks, if you will, uh, can, are very good at doing that. And so um, what we've done basically is develop a set of APIs for the, uh, again, leveraging the campus wireless infrastructure, but basically using 
uh, you know, this device that we all carry around as a proxy for uh, a person, right? How many, we're gonna, we're gonna basically use the number of Wi-Fi connected devices in this space as an estimator for how many people are in this room. And so we've actually done studies, and what's interesting is, so how many, what do you think the number is? What's the ratio? How many devices per person at Georgia Tech? How many devices connected to the internet? To the radio? Huh? 2.2? 2. 2. 2? Yeah. So when we started doing this work, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago, it was 0.8, right? And now it's more, it's generally more than two, right? And what's crazy is, you know, every couple of years we have to go back and validate, right? We have to send people out with clipboards to actually write down how we count the people in a space and then go compare it to our API because it, you know, it keeps changing. And, you know, I think, I think I've got at least three on right now, right? And so, um, it's actually a very interesting study in itself as to what's this ratio. But the point is, this estimator turns out to be really good and it allows us to do things like, so this is in Clough, um, counting the uh, number of people uh, in the space uh, around Starbucks. So we can't tell if you're in line at Starbucks or not, but we can tell if you're in that you know, within, uh, say, 30 feet of the line of Starbucks, right? And the first thing you see is this, so the yellow line is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, and the red line is weekends. And then the first thing you see is this pattern where it's obviously class change schedule. People close their laptops, they get up and they move around in club, and then they turn it back on, right? Um, and what's interesting at a place like Georgia Tech, of course, is that picture looks different Monday, Wednesday, Friday versus Tuesday, Thursday, because we have a different class schedule, right? But we actually used this in the early days after Clough opened, right, to help uh, motivate Starbucks to stay open past midnight, because originally they were closing at like 11, and they were, we said, you know, uh, look, there's people in the building till 2 a.m. There's, you know, there's a big group of people in the building till 2 a.m. And um, then there's a, a, a pretty good sized group after that, right? And so Starbucks ended, you know, uh, opened later and, and um, now, uh, you know, the students here get more wired. Um, what else can we do? It's not just how many people in a space, but what, what, what are the mobility patterns? What else can we do with this type of infrastructure is look at uh, where things move around campus, right? Where do these radios move, right? I don't have to know who the people are. I just see these radios moving around, and I can make a pretty good guess that most of those radios are associated with a person and that we can, we can actually look at movement around campus over time, right? So this, we work with facilities to help you know, study things like, uh, we just did a major change of the way sch class scheduling does, works on campus, right? right? We, we finally have a big enough gap between classes that you can actually get between classes this semester. Um, uh, all of that is, is, you know, those kinds of studies and those kinds of changes are, can, be, can be documented, can be motivated by, hey, we've got real data now to show people are actually trying to get from ISYE to College of Management between classes, right? This is an anomaly. Lots of people actually try to do it. I, I had a class schedule where I had to do it teaching. It wasn't any fun, and I was late every time, right? Um, and it's much easier now. So, ah, transportation needs. The, the, you know, the Tech Express shuttle, right? We have data showing exactly that, yes, there's a need for this. Lots of people moving between Clough and Tech Square directly, right? And we can look at how turning on, you know, how deploying that shuttle actually changed people's patterns. People actually would head there and get on the bus rather than walking the other way. Parking needs, new walkways, all sorts of interesting applications of that. Um, 
All right, so uh, uh, back to the lower wind discussion. One of the things we're actually, and tying it to campus, what we're actually doing is deploying uh, this base station technology on campus to use. So we have some devices that are uh, similar to this, I guess. Um, uh, one of them, um, you can see mounted to the outside of the aware home. How many of you heard of the aware home? It's on, uh, yes, it's on, uh, it's a house that George Deck owns, purpose built for doing in-home studies, uh, you know, technology application in the home, for instance. And uh, so uh, it also turns out it's a nice sort of on the edge of campus uh, location for us to uh, put one of these and then test, okay, how, you know, how far the home park, how much of campus can we, can we reach from there? Um, and the idea is, uh, you know, to be looking at uh, the, you know, what kind of density do we need and what kind of applications can we do at different densities. But basically, we're deploying this uh, on campus and it's open for the rest of you to use, right? Anybody that wants to play with, do some sensor applications, some studies on campus, um, we're, we're setting ourselves up to support that and that's what we're trying to, um, that's what we want uh, you to be able to take advantage of. <laughs> um, so far we've done some, some capacity testing, uh, both mobile and stationary, um, and what we're expecting is with, with two or three of these base stations, we can cover all of campus, including inside buildings, right? That's part of what we have to value, right? Because this is really low power, low data rate, right? And it doesn't actually have to, um, you know, we're not trying to watch YouTube on this, right? And so, I don't know, maybe it's six, maybe it's 10. Maybe we gotta double the budget and deploy 20. But for Wi-Fi, we've got over 6,000 access points. We've got one, two, three, probably four in this room. Uh, the Clough classrooms, the big ones, have like 18 access points in them. Um, so you compare the infrastructure cost, the infrastructure deployment, to uh, a technology like Wi-Fi, and it, it, it doesn't even come close, right? Similar with cellular, right? Uh, even, at even at 10 nodes, we will have fewer um, LoRa base stations, gateways on campus, than we have cellular uh, uh, sites deployed by AT&T and Verizon, right? On the top of several buildings and inside several buildings, we have uh, cell sites on this campus because we got to get that that infrastructure and that, that bandwidth right all the way into this kind of space right um, uh, very different scale of deployment uh, again why am I talking about this as being viable for supply chain today this is why right the infrastructure is so much cheaper and so much more feasible to deploy at a scale that, yeah, for a few thousand dollars, I can cover the whole shipping yard, All right? I can cover, uh, I can put one of these base stations on every ship, right? Uh, and have a, you know, one cellular or satellite uplink, but the uh, tracking of every package inside the ship, right? And that's the model that we use for, that we're thinking about this. So some projects that are going on on campus, and I'll, I'll wrap up here uh, with just a few more slides. Um, working with Matt Swartz at Center for GIS on, uh, they have this long running project deploying air quality sensors. Um, and uh, what they've been typically using Wi-Fi. What we're doing at this point is, is planning to augment those sensors with LoRa. So that we have, what it's gonna give us is a really nice reference point. Right? So we're going to have this device we can get to and configure and manage because it already has a Wi-Fi, but we can, we can add the LoRa capability to it. And again, it's part of this, this proof of concept and testing uh, to figure out what, what LoRa is good for and, and what it takes to really maintain it. 
Uh, urban beehive, how many of you have seen the, you know, Georgia Tech has, has bees, right? We have bee studies projects, yeah. Um, uh, very cool uh, work. Uh, one of the interesting applications here is, how do we know how many bees are in the, uh, in the hive or how much honey they produce? Well, it turns out that's actually pretty easy to do just by knowing the weight of the hive. And so all we really need is once a day, a few times a day, get a, a data point from that thing wherever it is. You don't need any wired infrastructure. All you need is a sensor on there that will tell you a few times a day how heavy is this thing, right? And so perfect application. While you're at it, throw in temperature and humidity and uh, vibration or whatever else and we'll see what we can come up with, right? And so uh, a neat um, project that, that, again, sort of uh, proving out what's possible. Uh, other sort of, think, think of any place that you might want to know how this thing works or the state of it or the health of it, but to date it's been impractical to run, to, to, to get real-time data because it was too expensive to run wires and power, you know, network and power to it. So instead, you know, here's a sunscreen dispenser in a park. All we need to know is, is it still working and how much product is left in it? Couple of, couple of samples a day. And for you know just a few dollars added to the cost of this thing, um, we can we can get that. Um, I sh I would be remiss in talking about these things without sort of talking about how I got here and sort of what connected me and my work to uh, this space and and uh, the supply chain group, um, uh, and that's this long running project we've we've had with uh, Professor Bartoldi and ISOE. Uh, monitoring or uh, augmenting, not just monitoring, but to improve the uh, transportation system for, for bus systems, uh, and in particular focusing on the bus budging problem. So uh, nothing worse than uh, walk, watching two trolleys follow each other right uh, around campus. And then you, the worst part of that is you know now it's going to be 20 minutes before you see the next one. Uh, and so uh, trying to improve on that and um, uh, that's kind of the, uh, at how I, as the IT guy and the networking guy, sort of started thinking about these, these um, supply chain related problems and logistics related problems over the years. Um, I'm going to leave you with this and say there's lots of opportunity here and I'm excited about it and I would be happy to talk to you about projects we can work on. Uh, and things you might think might be interesting to try out on campus and you know uh, if you have an idea for actually you know playing with something to, to do a trial on campus for a class project or a research project or just some crazy idea you have for a startup I'm, 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 I'm in right but that's why Bill and I are here but uh, there are some things we have to worry about and there's some things that, that we obviously have to pay attention to as we bring the entire everything online. Um, privacy being a big one. Both personal privacy, right, uh, about us and, and tracking location and knowing too much about us, but also this, this data sharing issue among, among competitors. There's a lot of work to be done there in, in sort of navigating the space of, yes, how do we actually do the, you know, rising tide floats all boats, but in order to get the rising tide, we actually have to all invest in um, uh, something and be willing to give something out, out for, uh, give something up, possibly that we think is proprietary in our competitive information. And there are some challenges to that. Um, security, I think the, the core, one of the core issues with security in IoT right now is the race to the bottom on price, right? And so, uh, you can get, uh, for instance, a, a really cheap webcam now, right, for 10 bucks to put it on the internet. Well, guess what? Why did it only cost 10 bucks? Because they're using a free software stack that no one's done security updates in 20 years. And guess what? As soon as you put that thing on the internet, it's going to be owned and it's going to be part of a bot. And it's not just going to be, your, your best hope is that 
they're not transmitting pictures of your house and sharing them with the world. There's actually a website you can go to and see all the open web cameras. Um, I don't post it, uh, so you'll have to Google. But um, that, you know, that's probably uh, not what they've stolen your phone for. What if they stole your, I mean, your your webcam for, it? or your smoke detector, or your whatever? They've taken it over so they can run Bitcoin. You know, they're 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 looking for processors anywhere in the world that they can harvest Bitcoin. Right, and so um, anyway, so the, the point is the the uh, challenge is that uh, you know hopefully we we've, we've decided we found the bottom and we're going to bounce up now and we're going to start taking the investment in the security and the of the software both the hardware and software security of these devices more seriously and say look uh, everything that comes into my shop. You know, every device that's connected to the internet in my warehouse is a potential liability. And we need to make sure we invest appropriately to secure it and manage that, that liability. Um, similarly, that leads me to the maintainability aspect. Um, uh, I have a whole bunch of commodity IoT home automation devices in my house that have this you know decent out of what we call the out of the box experience where you you open it up and you're all excited and you follow the setup instructions and you get it working and you get the app and you can make the light turn on and off from across the room with your app and you go wow that's cool and then it doesn't work one day and you have no idea how to troubleshoot it you have no idea how to start even fixing it and so typically what I do is I go back to the startup instructions and I push the reset button and I, start, I, do the, you know, I try again. And if that doesn't work, I throw it away because there is no help for how you debug it, right? There is no, no solution to fix it. And then the, um, you know, one of the things we talk about that's a big issue in this space is the, what I call the life cycle mismatch, right? How many of you have seen uh, ads or purchased your very own LED light bulbs? Right? Replacement LED bulbs, right? How long do they how long are they supposed to last? Years, right? I've i i purchased them that say 20 year life expectancy, right? And when we talk about especially in investment in infrastructure, right? Street lights, uh, you know, relighting my entire uh, warehouse, right? The, the, you know, the, the investment, the expectation of the people building something like that is this should last 20 years, right? I, I, can't, I can't afford to do this every year, right? One of the big problems with that is, can you name a radio technology that has lasted 20 years? How, how long has this device using Bill's cell phone, Bill's smartphone, right? I said, the, the basic smartphone idea is 10 years old, right? But guess what? The radios on here are about six years old. The radio that was in, I, I have my original uh, iPhone, because it's cool, right? It's a museum. Uh, it goes in my museum. Uh, and my kids go, oh my gosh, it was so thick. Heavy. How did you use that? And it still powers on and it still works. But I can't make calls with it. Why? Because AT&T turned off, that was a 2G radio. AT&T turned that off four years ago. Doesn't work anymore. They turned it off because they needed the spectrum to support 3G and 4G and all these new things we're doing. It makes sense. More efficient use of the radio space. But uh, I can't deploy this streetlight with a 20-year LED lifespan claim and even pretend that that radio is going to work for 20 years. Guess what? The Wi-Fi radios, if you have an 802.11b only radio in your device, guess what? We don't support it on campus anymore. We turned it off several years ago for the same reason that AT&T turned off 2G. By supporting your 10-year-old radio, 
It slows down the rest of us, right? Doing with you know everybody else. So we turn it off. And most people that operate Wi-Fi networks do the same thing. So you know, over and over we see this issue again where you know life life cycle on, on this this radio infrastructure is still much shorter and the refresh rate is much shorter than um, the uh, you know the, these other technologies we're now attaching them to. Right? My my Wi-Fi thermostat is another good example. Right? When I put it on the wall, I replaced a perfectly good analog thermostat that was still working and was 30 years old. How long do you think my Wi-Fi thermostat will, will work, continue to work? At best, in 10 years, it will still allow me to walk up to it and change the temperature. I'm sure the app will work in that. Honeywell will have decided they don't support that. But I'm sure, I mean, that's my best case, is I can walk up and it, that it will work as good as the analog one I took off the wall, right? And so I didn't throw away the analog one. It's still in the box uh, in the closet. So that when I come in one night and the internet is down and I can't turn on the heat, I can rip that sucker off the wall and put the other one back on, right? So, um, uh, and then finally, and then, you know, that leads to this resilience issue, right? Um, the whole point of this is to improve resilience. And I think that's probably our, our 2018 buzzword applied to the IoT space is resilience. You know, being able to, uh, to respond to disaster, deal with the unexpected. And um, our mantra should be, as we deploy these things, we're going to increase resilience, not decrease it. Right? And too many of the uh, technologies we deploy become a new single point of failure uh, and actually uh, reduce our resilience. All right, uh, thank you for your time, and I'll be glad to take a few questions <coughs> as long as uh, time allows. Okay. Thoughts, questions, discussions? What, how can you use this stuff in your life? And what do you... Uh, what are you uh, What are you excited about, and what are you afraid of? Right. Yes. Uh, great presentation. So, uh, Thank you. Two quick sub questions. Um, could you delve into uh, what do you think Georgia Tech could distinguish ourselves in competing with the the MITs and uh, Stanford? Also, if you can, uh, I was familiar with the ISYE pod project, or physical internet project. Mm -hmm. I just want to get your thoughts. Uh, uh, actually, the expert uh, just stepped out uh, uh, about the physical internet. Uh -huh. Yeah, so if you, if you look at the physical internet concept, it, it uh, one of the, the, the key tenets is always on, always connected. Uh, containers, standardized containers throughout the world. So obviously um, to fulfill this mission of the physical internet, IoT is, is the central technology. So um, so he, uh, he led the question with, with how do I think Georgia Tech can distinguish themselves in this space uh, relative to the MITs and the Stanfords and Obviously, I'm biased, and I think we've already done that. Uh, but uh, the uh, I, so I think, and you know, honestly, this is why I'm excited about this work in this space is because uh, we we have a well-established reputation. Obviously, a top program in supply chain around the world. Uh, everywhere I go, you know, people know that and and refer to that. And uh, but we also have. Uh, these, the, the ability to do uh, this kind of deployment and real test bed in an urban environment, right? The urban logistics is one of the sort of key challenges of this, the, you know, the, the next generation of, you know, moving every more and more people into the bigger and bigger cities. Um, and guess what? We happen to have a campus that sits in an urban environment uh, the campus has a really nice test bed, but then we don't have to go very far. Guess, you know, this, this urban canyon problem isn't just a, 
um, uh, you know, a, a lab exercise for us. I have it every time the trolley pulls in front of the MARTA station. Uh, it, it's, it's blocked by three new buildings that it can't see, right? And so congestion, uh, dealing with you know these day-to-day -day realities of, of, of life in the, in the city. Um, Georgia Tech is, is a perfect place to do that kind of work, and I think I'm excited about some of the stuff we can do here. Good question. Yes, sir. Russ, uh, yeah, great presentation. Um, are you doing anything with the, the North Avenue? Order project or anything like that, that you know, are they totally separate? Yeah, we, we um, not day to day, uh, directly, absolutely directly involved. And in, and one of the uh, application, one of the aspects of that is this uh, uh, sensor package there that's being deployed, prototyped and deployed uh, on the light poles across, you know, along the North Avenue corridor. Um, and we've definitely. Uh, uh, worked with that team and are you know very interested in you know it brings up a, a lot of these issues of uh, uh, the challenge of, of what should be in that package and how you maintain it and, and how you deploy it and maintain it and, and uh, support it uh, but also the data sharing agreements right uh, we're we're already into the um, oh we're going to put cameras in there who can see that data right what is that right and who is and how do we make that data, how do we make data available from these things um, uh, and, and deal with the privacy and security, but also the scalability, right? One of the big impediments we run into with data sharing is, oh, I would love to share, I have all of this real-time data from our transit system, uh, and, and we use it every day, and it's, it's available, and it's very reliable, but I can't let you have access to it because you'll crash my server. Right, and so working with them to scale that, right, uh, delivery of that data is a big part of what uh, we we have worked on in the, the city space. And yeah, uh, good question. Yeah. Other thoughts? Question? Yes, sir. So I want to know more about if uh, about ongoing projects uh, on uh, asset tracking, which you talked about. How are you going to use the printable trackers? Uh, you. Is there anything going on? <clears throat> so uh, we have not uh, gotten our hands on any of them yet. Uh, the from the from the Laura uh, in the Laura space. So we've done I mean, we've done RFID stuff and like that in the past. But these new printable trackers are uh, just announced like three months ago or something. I think less than that. Yeah. Um, I mean the, the the plan has been there for a couple of years. We finally have uh, seen that someone's actually <coughs> starting to manufacture these. Um, so uh, we're going to try to get our hands on some as soon as possible and start doing some of that uh, testing. And uh, what I mean, ultimately, there's there's a bunch of work to be done. And you know, now you know we, we, we understand the theory. How will it work in practice, uh, especially in the urban environment where uh, guess what? This you know, spectrum is limited, and these aren't the only radios we're going to see, right? We're going to see there's, there's going to be a lot of noise. Uh, and so one of the, the research areas is really in, uh, you know, how do we optimize for battery life and, uh, you know, sort of minimizing cost, but at the same time deal with the noise we're going to see in this radio space and and what is that? What are the requirements in terms of the actual density of those base stations, of those gateways? Right. We we know we can do six or eight or ten and get coverage across campus so that I can get a message three times a day that says the temperature of the package. Right. But if I actually want to tell you the package just got set on my front porch, that's going to require a lot more density, and we don't know what that density is yet. Uh, so that's kind of the, I think the, so that's one of the sort of research questions, if you will, um, is is uh, <coughs> figuring out for those different applications we might be interested in asset tracking, what are the trade-offs going to be of power, cost, and density of the base station? Uh, but love to um, talk more about it and, and look for, again, I think figuring out 
uh, in you know, supply chain is a big space. Warehousing is a big space. You know, logistics is a big space. There, but there are specific applications where we can say, ah, let's focus on this particular question of of uh, uh, tracking within a certain type of warehouse or a certain type of manufacturing process or whatever it is. Right? Yes, sir. You might have mentioned it, but how much is the cost of one of those base stations, like the Laura? I mean, just for that piece of hardware. Good. Yeah, go ahead. So this is an interior gateway. Um, cost is around five hundred dollars, one hundred one. Um, something that you're going to mount outdoors, like we have at the aware home, is more in the twelve hundred dollar range. Um, and they're they're. Becoming more and more suppliers of those, the prices are, are coming down a little bit, but you know they've already come down a good bit. Um, some of these, you know, the different end nodes that we have, um, uh, you can get those in some cases, you know, fifteen dollars and under um, in a, a prototyping kind of format here. Um, the goal for the the printable slap-on sticker version is well under a dollar. Um, we're probably a few years out from that. Um, functionally, there's really no difference between those um, sticker-based ones and one of these, except you know, the battery is much smaller, and you know, you, you're really only looking at that battery to last for whatever the duration of a shipment is. So we're talking on the order of a week or two. Um, and in that case, you can do a, a 3D printed battery um, and and just let it run out and it gets thrown away. Yeah, and these, you know, these experimenter kits have a USB port on them, so we can program it. Obviously, there's not going to be a USB port on a sticker, right? So when you think about the scale uh, and how they'll get that cost down, that's part of where that comes from. Thanks. All right, oh, yeah. Um, hi, Professor. Uh, it seems to me that the, the biggest challenge is uh, data sharing. That's a data sharing platform, so because you need two things that are essential for it to be effective will be privacy in one hand, and on the other one will be uh, transparency. Because you don't want to share some information that are added value for your business, and on the other side, you want to make sure that everyone else is getting the right information from that entity as well. Mm -hmm. So you need like kind of an administrator at some point, could be a government entity, and they need to have transparency over that. But why would they do that when they don't want to lose this particular added value that they have as information and put it there? So I don't know how that can happen. And yesterday, we were, uh, no, I think it was on Monday, where he was talking about smart city. And to have a smart city, you need to have all the information available, just not like three entities, but all of them. Right. And it seems so complicated to me, especially in a capitalistic uh, system that we have. Uh, I, I, uh, I completely agree. Uh, I don't think I, I have an easy answer for you, except you know, part of the, you know, part of my goal with, with this uh, sort of when I do these presentations is absolutely to raise it and say, you know, to to your point that we have to address this, and and the only thing way I know. Um, you know, we talk about you know the, you can't boil the ocean. We're not, not going to solve them all at once. We're going to we're going to have to find some specific examples where you know people will agree to share and then see value out of it. And um, remarkably, actually, in some of the related but you know I should say unrelated work, but with some of the same issues, uh, we've had. Uh, on with with one of our other hats on is is in healthcare data, right? So similar, there's similar, very serious challenges around privacy and and competitive environment. But there is a greater good of improving the way healthcare operates, right? And so we are starting to see, and you know, we have examples of successes in moving that beast forward, right? The machine forward into doing some better data sharing. I, I think that, you know, and, but by no means are all the issues solved and we have to keep fighting it, you know, sort of one new project at a time and one new application at a time. And you're exactly right that 
um, as we as we've done this around the you know worked as projects around the world, you know every culture, every business environment has a different set of constraints, and we have to you know uh, do some of, start some of this over. I you know some of the things that are possible to do here. Uh, I can't even begin to propose in Panama. On the other hand, there are some things we can do there because it is a smaller, uh, more well-defined space with, uh, you know, you can go down the street and literally bump into government officials, right, <laughs> uh, uh, of the, the central government, and that makes things easier to solve than, than trying to solve it at a scale of, of here. So anyway, so you're... You're dead on. You're absolutely right. But yeah, I would like for any scare, for instance, in uh, in France, we have a public health care, so we don't have to pay. Right, right. Pay. Different. Uh, yeah. So it could work right there because you can share information. Everyone like benefits from it. Right. And to bounce back on uh, on health care, do you know the impact of all those connected uh, sensors that we we are always connected? We're receiving waves. And on the long term, what's the impact on our heads? Oh, oh heavens, that's a totally different conversation. Yes. I, know. <laughs> I know because you had like IoT like pitfall. Yeah, Is yeah. That one of them? No, uh, yeah. Uh, wow, we could have a totally different. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert in that space at all. Right? Uh, other thoughts? Good questions. Yes, sir. Uh, I was thinking about the line of pitfalls as well. Um, since we're having the trends, we want to put sensors everywhere, right? How big of a challenge is for security concerns since I'm tracking everything? That means I have more data, and that data can fall into the wrong hands or should explode them. So how, like, what the, what's the magnitude of, of the upgrades in security that people and companies have to do? I can't even begin to estimate. Let's just say it's it's real and it's big, right? I mean, the you're asking, you know, what's the cost of security? Or I just like uh, the impact or how the depth of the challenge, like. No, I mean, I think it it you know it's in my pitfalls. You know, the, two of the three things I think in my pitfalls list are things you mentioned there, right? I think um, so. There's absolutely real issues with securing the devices and uh, you know being able to maintain the infrastructure and keep it protected. But then what about the data and what it reveals and especially all of the data combined, what it reveals about us personally. And um, I think we're going to have, you know, we have a we have a long way to go in terms of we're going to see, you know, regulatory uh, as, you know, aspects of this. We're going to see um, uh, liability, right? You know, I think the you know the lawsuits are just beginning in terms of uh, uh, what people are uh, being exposed. What what perceived liability, perceived risk is in terms of what we're giving up. You know, we don't even know yet. So no, it, it's big conversation. Tough tough things to work on, but. Hey, that's why we're here, to solve these problems. All right, thank you all for your time, and uh, have a great day. If you can give uh, Dr. Clark a round of applause, thank you.